Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. Uh, good evening from Mozambique here. And welcome, everyone, to the second event of the ISH Live. So as good to say, I'm Neuza. I'm a cardiologist, and I practice at Maputo Central Hospital. And I, I'm a member of the new investigative committee of the International Society of Hypertension. It is an absolute pleasure to be here today, hosting this session with Gutu. Dr. Agutu Mantezano is a welcome fellow of cardiovascular medicine at the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Science of the University of Glasgow. And he's a passionate advocate uh, for trainees and early career scientists. And he's a member of the mentorship and training committee of the International Society of Hypertension. As you all know, today we'll be talking about the challenges and that researchers around the world are facing due to COVID-19 pandemic and also opportunities that it brought. And we are lucky to have here with our special guests uh, that are, can, uh, come from different backgrounds, uh, are in different levels of their career uh, research career, but they have at least one important thing in common. They all work with uh, early career researchers and are very keen to help in their professional and, and personal development. So we, we welcome here Professor Stephanie Watts. Uh, she, she is a professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology of, at Michigan State University. And she serves on uh, editorial boards of several journals and has been committed to graduate education and mentoring. We also here is uh, Mrs. Christina Kelly. She's a licensed to the, uh, clinical social worker and outreach coordinator at University of Utah Counseling Center and has worked in the field of social work uh, for the past 23 years in a variety of settings. And we have here also Dr. Lillian Bao. She's a medical doctor and a public health practitioner. She is currently the CEO of the Kenya Cardiac Society. She has extensive experience working with, as a scientist and advocate and mentor in resource uh, limited settings. Also with that is Dr. Josie Fullerson, who is a research associate at the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Science at the University of Glasgow. She's a senior postdoc and chair of the network for ECR development. She's very active in the task of opening opportunities for ECRs. And finally, we have also Dr. Dylan Barga. He's a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and associate professor at the University of Ottawa. He's current chair of the communications uh, uh, for the International Society of Hypertension. So Gutu will explain the format of, of this session and start our conversation today. So here today like so what we plan for you guys uh this oh by the way this is being recorded because then you're going to tra get, uh, transfer to other uh participants and put in our podcast in the uh, ish social media and website uh so i hope everybody doesn't mind but what we plan today is to do something like a little different from other covid talks that we had like uh throughout this past two years which i hope i thought it would be just like three months uh, so we're going to first I like give you like a look back of our first reactions, the first impressions when the whole COVID pandemic started. And that's what we wanted to do. And then after we're going to talk about mitigation plans that we had to put together in order to cope with the changes and then look uh, to the future and then try to discuss and predict how COVID has shaped or will shape our future. So just to get started to all our speakers, uh, we would like to know, like, what was your first reactions when uh, COVID started? Just like to set the, the, the stage, in my case, I was just coming back from a conference in Italy when I heard that uh, there is a possibility of the COVID-19 becoming like a pandemic. And the moment that I get, like, I, I could still taste, you know, um, the ice cream, the gelato there, like in my mouth, and then I get here, I get this news that the labs may close. So we need to focus and concentrate on priorities and prepare for the worst in terms of closure. And that really happened. Many lockdowns, many months of closure of lab closure. And I would like to know from you, uh, what do you mean? Uh, how was for you, your first reactions, your first impressions? And Josie, I think we can start with you with like the postdoc uh, perspective. 
Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Kuto. It's lovely to be here and see such wonderful things going on for these years. And so for my first initial reaction from COVID, I was actually on annual leave because myself and my partner had just bought a house and we were moving into her, our house on the Friday and I just took a week off and I got a, a message from my PI saying, um, so you know you're on annual leave, but you won't be coming back when you finish. And I was, had to be like, what are you talking about? I've, I've, you know, I'll take a week off, unpack my boxes and I'll be back. But uh, of course, COVID had hit, the labs were being shut for what we thought was three weeks at first. Um, and we were really lucky in that we were able to move out of our flat and we were able to move into the house and my in-laws were able to get back to where they came from, <laughs> most importantly. Um, but yeah, it was a huge shock. You know, all our research, all our work, as you guys know, had to go and hold. Everything was just stopped. And it, it, was, it was very, very bizarre. And it was like we'd been shipped away to a safe house because it was, a, you know, like our new home. We couldn't have people around to visit. It felt like I'd been shipped away to a weird location where I wasn't allowed to see my friends and family for an unknown period of time. And Josie, you mean like when you said that your PI wrote you saying you're not coming back, does that mean that you, you got furloughed? So the first thing was, is we weren't sure how long it was going to go on for. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, my PI suggested that we'd we look at look, working at the lighthouse lab. So here in the UK, we have the testing centers where the COVID samples go, they get tested and sent, sent out, the results get sent out. Um, but because I've got asthma, they didn't, they said that they, they would rather I didn't join them there. So myself and my PI had a discussion and we decided to put me on furlough when we realized that three weeks was turning into three months. And well, I, I was furloughed from the end of April until the start of August. And then I came back part time when the building started opening again. And can can you explain to us like a, like shortly like uh, uh, in a short way like what furlough means? Like, yeah. So essentially, furlough means that the university because so when we were put in furlough, we were at home, and because I wasn't doing the work that the grant it funds me, I wasn't doing the work from this grant. I essentially was being paid to sit at home. So furloughed meant that the government paid for me to sit at home, but also the university, um, I think they paid, was it 80% the government paid and the, the university paid 20%. So it meant that we could save money, that was charity money, um, for me to go back to when the labs opened up. Because obviously you, you guys know when you're, on a, when you're on a grant, it's like a ticking you know, time bomb until you, you have to have your results done, you have to have your work done. So it was, yeah, furlough meant that I wasn't able to do my research, but I was able to do personal development things at home. So I could work on papers, I could go on courses, um, but all from my very new office. Um, and it, yeah, it was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to hear more from that, Josie. But Stephanie, Dylan and, and Lillian, as like PIs and more like senior researchers, how was... Uh, from your perspective, not only to have to close your lab, but break those kind of news to your staff members to say, listen, you can, uh, I don't know if all the labs were closed uh, where you are, but let's say you can come to do your research. And how was that process of having to deal with the fact that you're closing your lab and you need to let your people that you care know about that? Stephanie, can start with you. Sure. Well, so I, I, I came into this scooter with something of a different perspective. My older son, who is seriously disabled, we'd just gotten him out of the hospital when he had unexpected grand mal seizures. Right? So I walked out of that and then understood that our labs were going to have to be able to close. So I walked out of a hospital having gratitude for my son being alive and saying, all right, I, I, I will be able to handle this. And all of my group was in constant contact with one another throughout the weeks we started talking about this, right? As we started to see this happening and we Zoomed where we could. And when we could, we stood and talked with one another. I said, this is what we're gonna have to do because your safety and your comfort is the most important thing to me. We'll get the work done. 
Right. And one thing I want to say to the younger folks that are here, and then I'll pass this on, is it has taken me 25 years to get to the point where I feel like I'm really adding to science. So though right now this feels so immediate to you and it feels like there are parts of your world that aren't going the way they are, know that senior people like me understand those pressures. We here at MSU, we are fighting. We were closed from, I think it was end of March until June, right? I did not have to furlough anybody, but I had two students defend their PhD, right? Over Zoom and in that time is that scientific life is longer than it feels like at the moment. And there are, there really are, there's more time than you think there is. There are more ways to get things done than you think there is. So I do not want you to look at COVID as something that stops you in your track and you shan't move any further. Right? You already know that's not true because you are moving. But if it's taken me 26 years to finally get to a point where I feel where I am, your path is long, right? There might be curves that go like this to it. COVID's one big one of them. Uh, you know, Gudo, really, I was most concerned about my people, the, the science. If we can be around and live to be around, the science will still be there to do. So. And Lydia, how, how was that for you? For me, I filled my time. Right, so we got a lot of papers published during that time. We went and we learned all the things on GraphPad Prism I didn't know how to do. Right. I said, well, I have the time to be able to do this. And during that time, I was taking care 24 seven of a very sick husband and a son that just came out of the hospital. So one of the things I hope you remember is you are more capable than you think you are. And for the challenges that you have, you will rise to them. Right? It's, it's, it's what you do. No, no, there is there, there is great. But was that like the same experience for uh, Dylan or Lillian? Lillian, uh, did how did that hit you and your group? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, so as mentioned, I work for a professional society. So we do projects uh, and we also do a bit of research. We're not, we don't have a lot of staff. We are quite lean. Uh, so initially the concern was what happens to our projects? Um, you know, and because if you can't do any activities and projects, our sponsors, what happens to our sponsors? Because we are a small organization. Uh, we rely on a small network of sponsors. So me as the CEO, that was my first concern is uh, we not be able to do our activities and our sponsors, our partners may lose interest in the organization. What happens uh, in terms of uh, career? So I had to really think about what is my next career move? Because as I said, it's a small organization, the finances are limited. So I foresaw that if this continued for a few months, uh, they may need to let me go. So I had to think critically about what should I do? Like what would be my next you know, career move? So that, those are the kind of things that were uh, going through my mind immediately uh, you know, around the time COVID started. And, and Dylan? Yeah, so my, my experience was fairly similar to Stephanie's in that our, our government indicated very quickly that they were going to provide supplements for keeping staff employed during, during the shutdown. And so I wasn't necessarily concerned for my staff in terms of employment. I was concerned in terms of impact on their, you know, their theses and projects and then tried to work with them to get moving on, you know, the things they could control, like comprehensive exams, like classwork that they could get out of the way so that when things opened up, um, that they'd be able to move. So, so that was sort of my, you know, from a lab standpoint, my reaction. Um, I was far more concerned initially. I mean, I did very little in the lab for probably the first three weeks. I was way more concerned with my family life and, and making sure that my kids felt safe. They had a routine that they got into so that they weren't sort of feeling the brunt of this. And so I, I, if I'm being honest, my lab didn't get the attention that, you know, I could have potentially given it because I was focused on family initially and then sort of gradually built out once my wife and I had a routine in place for the kids. And Christina, how was for you? Well, it, um, I guess the silver lining of this experience has been 
that we learned how to do telehealth. So <laughs> uh, prior to COVID, we did all of our clinical work face-to-face, uh, -face, you know, individual counseling, group counseling. It was all here at our counseling center. Um, and I'm really proud to say that our administration here at the counseling center figured out within two weeks time how to switch services over to online services. Yeah. So within, by the end of March, really, we had transitioned over to doing individual and group therapy um, online. And that was an adjustment for sure for all of us. Uh, I have to say that I think students, our clients adjusted to it a lot quicker than we did. <laughs> I'll speak for myself. I just wasn't used to doing the work of therapy in this format. You know, it was a whole new world, a whole new way of relating to clients when you can't reach out and hand them a tissue, you know, when you can't show your engagement as clearly through through the nonverbal communication. So that was quite an adjustment. And now where we're at is um, we have adopted a hybrid model. So uh, as of fall of this year, uh, we have transitioned back to campus. And um, now we find that there are many students who still prefer to do telehealth for their therapeutic services. It's a lot easier access to people and access to more students has increased because of being able to offer telehealth. And then I also have clients who have very clearly said like, no, I wanna come in and see you in your office. So it's frankly quite nice now to be able to offer a hybrid model. And, and Christina, like you're mentioning, like uh, everybody was going through this, right? So we need to learn how to connect virtually and how to be a human being virtually. Uh, and most of us didn't know how to do it. And most of us like lacked a little bit of the, those skills. And at the same time, we had to deal with like our students that were uh, at point freaking out or even like uh, colleagues that were uh, breaking, uh, have their breaking points in different times and need to be strong for each other. Like in terms of like, uh, of counseling, like how do you think, like how can, what can we do in order to become um, stronger for these people that come to us and then be able to help them while going through all these changes at the same time? Because mm -hmm. I, I will be honest with you, like at some point I was talking to somebody else here at my institute and the person just turned to me and said, "Like, well, we are in a leader. You are in a leader leadership position, so that's your job. So you need to hold the, you know, the, the ship strong." And I'm like, "But I'm allowed to have feelings as well, and I'm going For through sure. this, and I and I I've never been in a pandemic before. So, so what would you tell us to help us to cope and help others?" Yes, for sure. Well, and I I guess I also just want to acknowledge that 2020, you know, is just such a, a storm for so many of us in so many ways, not just pandemic wise, but for those of us in the United States, there's a lot of social unrest and a lot, uh, a lot happening in our country. Yeah, I see Stephanie really resonating with that, yes. So I just want to really acknowledge that it was very challenging for people's mental and emotional health on all levels, right? From students to clinicians to faculty, et cetera. Um, and then in regards to how to stay strong, well, I, I really love what Stephanie's comment was earlier regarding um, being able to keep in mind the temporal nature of things. Um, so on a on a day to day basis, especially for those people who might still be under more isolated lockdown situations. Um, we really advocate for people maintaining a structure and routine to their day. Um, we as humans we do thrive on having routines. And one of the things that's really challenging when you're at home all the time is it can be really easy to have that get pretty lax. Um, and then you can kind of lose your footing for the structure and routine of your day. Um, secondly, we are social creatures. We are meant, we are neurobiologically designed to connect with one another. And so if you're on lockdown or if there's ways in which you can connect with other humans, really set that as a priority. You know, set time. If it has to be done via Zoom, do it. But we made sure to maintain things like uh, having lunch together, even if it was over Zoom, 
having our happy hours after work, you know, but being able to maintain contact or if you can see each other in person, socially distance outside, that too is really critical. Um, I think being able to take into account, as Stephanie was mentioning, the temporary nature of these things. So when we keep, uh, when we're experiencing that crisis, the intensity of the emotion can really feel so very challenging at that moment. But we do have to remember that all things change and all things shift. And that's where practicing some, uh, what we call emotion regulation skills can really be useful. So for example, mindfulness meditation practice can be a wonderful way to help with distress tolerance. Um, I do have a great COVID workbook uh, designed to address issues of mental health. And Guto, for you or Brandy, I could send that to you, either of you or both of you, and then maybe if you want to send it out to the larger group. It has some great suggestions and skills for working with um, mental health concerns while in a pandemic. Yeah, no, if you don't mind, that would be amazing. I think like many of us would love to, uh, to, to have it because it will yes. help. I'll be happy to send that to you. So just to remember everybody who's watching us, like guys, please ask questions, like don't be shy. If there's anything that we're not mentioning here and you wanted to ask, go ahead. Yeah. And just to finish this topic and then we can move on with uh, uh, the other to our second topic. Now you yeah, guys mentioned that you need to, uh, you had to change your personal lives. Yes, so you had to change your personal lives. So just to close off in your mind, like each one of you give like a little perspective, like how did you like, how did you manage working from home and then mixing your personal life with your professional life? And then there was a, it's yours, the floor. Jose, you can start with you again. Yeah, of course. So um, for, for my personal life, it was a challenge as, as the rest of you will have gone through. Um, I'm a very sociable person. I love being around people. So my social network was totally shattered. Um, I have a horse and I love my horse and I wasn't allowed to go up to the yard to see him for nine weeks, which for those of you who have pets is, is pretty horrible to go through. And then on top of that, my partner went away to Taiwan for work for three weeks, uh, three months, sorry, three weeks, three months. Um, so I was living by myself. I couldn't see my horse. My dad is uh, he's got asthma and he's on immunosuppressants. My gran, who's now sadly passed away, but she was in a care home and my mum was only able to visit her once a, once a week. And I couldn't see my folks, as, as many of you, you couldn't either. Um, so my personal life was totally turned upside down. Um, and I did struggle, as everybody else did, but I tried to... What, what got a little bit weird was, I think my caring side, I started like baking, which I've never done before. I started growing plants, which I've never been interested before. And like a sourdough starter, I've never done that before, but I grew one and I made bread and subjected like my new neighbors who had never met before to all this hideous baking I was trying to do. So I was- You can bring to, to your neighbors on the floor down <laughs> from you. Like I'm, I would love to have some of those, the sourdough. <laughs> you really don't get all <laughs> I like you too much. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> but um yeah so I, around my work I would try and do like a morning workout like uh, Christina said I would try and have a structure so I'd get up in the morning I would do um a workout I would try and do some work around papers or courses or anything like that and in the evening I would try and zoom or phone either my parents my friends or my partner but obviously with Taiwan there's different uh time zones and everything like that um so yeah it, it was I tried my best and I think the probably the best thing I did was um, we ended up getting a, a rescue dog from Spain um, and he just totally like brightened as animals do. They just totally brighten up your day. So that really helped my personal life and my mental health um, and it also improved my work because I was happier. But I definitely say as well, I should say my PI was so supportive and when I was having a crap day, she would support me and send me flowers or even just a little message being like, the world's on fire just now. Don't worry if you're not working properly. You, you can't function as normal in this normal situation, abnormal situation. Elsa, did you want to say something? Yeah. 
No, I was looking at the chat. We have a question here from Chloe. I think this is uh, to Christina. In terms of mental health support, if she seen uh, an increase in people seeking counseling when COVID started, and what were the biggest issues that people were experiencing? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Nusa. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, yes, the the most definite all capital exclamation point yes we have seen huge increases in demand for mental health services not only at our counseling center but with clinicians in the community as well people's mental health has significantly suffered because of the pandemic uh, biggest issues are definitely things like anxiety depression uh, both of those things often related to social isolation and having their life and general routines so disrupted. Um, so that has been very difficult. Um, for students at the university, it's been very challenging to not have the interaction both with classmates and professors. So, you know, this day-to-day -day stuff that we often take for granted, you know, stopping by and asking a professor a question about the lecture, checking in like, hey, I didn't quite understand that concept. Can you clarify that? those simple interactions that we used to take for granted were no longer available to students. The structure and routine of coming to campus, seeing friends here, going, being in a class with peers, that was so, so missed. So yes, depression, anxiety, social isolation, and with that sense of anxiety that was um, very prevalent and dealing before vaccinations and so on, um, that certainly was interfering with students' ability to learn. Thank you. So I was just watching the time here. So I think like Nelsa, we can move mm -hmm. to mitigation and- uh... Okay. So regarding mitigation, we wonder uh, what action plans have you taken? This is to all of you, especially those who are running labs or are responsible for others. Did you have uh, any action plan to mitigate the negative impacts uh, of COVID-19. Uh, I could start, maybe Stefan could help us with this one first. Yes, yeah, sure. So I'm not worried about me, right? I'm probably the oldest in this group right now. So my career is not something I'm concerned with, but I remained hugely concerned about the people that are with me. So I sat with them each individually and we worked out a plan for what they were gonna do. And as I said, uh, this is not just a week by week plan, but an also a month by month plan, because I had two students, they graduated over Zoom, right? And that's the first time my PhDs have ever had to defend over Zoom. And normally that's a time where they know they're going to get a great big hug from me at the end because I'm so damn proud of them. Right? And, and I couldn't do that. I think what was so important in NUSA is them knowing I was right there for them, right? That, that I was, but Gudo, to your point, so we all know what a sine wave is, right? And so what you hope is you've got a lot of sine waves going on in your group and that the amplitude of all sine waves don't meet at the same point. So when one person is okay, right? They're helping the other person that's not. And I've looked at them and said, I'm human too. Right? I have a son who has now a seizure disorder and I have a husband that's nearly died four times in the last two years. These are people I'm worried about. Right. But when I would make a plan with someone and I had one associate look at me and said, Stephanie, my brain is not in a good place. I said, what would it take to get your brain to be in a good place? She said, I need to go away for a week. I said, okay, you figure out how to do what you need because them being with me long-term is so important. So if in the short term, we don't quite get done what we hope to, I'm fine with it. So, so really I work with each person individually at NUSA and I try mm -hmm. to have as much grace, right? You give people as much space, knowing that not only will I give that to them, but I hope they give that to me as well. Thank you, Stefan. I hope that others hear you because I think that's important, yeah. Maybe I can just add to that too, because yeah. I'll say the one thing that I had to do, uh, I realized very quickly with lab meetings was that it wasn't gonna work, that everybody had these new you know, schedules and responsibilities and, and so, I ended up having to pivot to individual meetings with my my trainees 
uh, rather than trying to do a regular lab meeting. And it's not ideal because you're not getting to interact with everybody together, but mm -hmm. it, just to make sure that I was seeing everybody and, and checking in, that's that's where we had to go with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dylan, uh, regarding your own career, I, I hear you, you were concerned and we all were concerned with our families first, but did you do anything? You had any plan to not see this affecting your career, especially? Oh yeah, and, I mean, I oh yeah, I mean, I I knew pretty quickly that it was going to impact my career. The timing was such that it was, you know, what I thought was COVID's sort of end was going to coincide with when I needed to renew grants, and and obviously having a year delay and stuff, the day the productivity wasn't going to be there, um, and so you know, I'm still in the process of dealing with this. And the only thing, you know, you. you that we do get opportunities to discuss this in um, our grants, at least in Canada, we can talk about the impact of COVID on mm -hmm. our productivity. And I just, I use that to the full extent as I can when I'm discussing where I'm at with some of the work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, and, I, sorry, <clears throat> come on, Jordi, I, I, Lillian, I was going to you. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah I, I think for me, the, the, the unique thing about COVID as I said, we have projects, we have grants, the whole world was affected. So unlike previously where maybe you had challenges like in Kenya where I am and you had to communicate to a donor, you're having challenges. In this case, even the donor is struggling with COVID. So it was easy to really communicate to our partners, our donors, because we are, we are all in this together. So it was easy. And, and that was that's what we did we, is, is quickly communicate to them that this is the change in plan, this is what we are planning to do, and that at least helped us, uh, you know, uh, keep in touch with them and, and, and plan and have sort of plan B and see how we can catch up, hopefully, you know, in the next few months. So I think for me, that's what I find unique about COVID is everybody, we are in it together. So it's about discussing and how do we address mm -hmm. the, the, what we are facing right now. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree, because I think, yeah. I think like for me, like what COVID, COVID helped me uh, was to I start like uh, identifying opportunities and then it helped me to also like understand the, in uh, the sense of priorities and uh, ensure that I get those opportunities and take something out of it. So like the win-win situation that I like to say to everyone really play like an important role to me. And I was like, I learned that whatever I'm doing from now on, it has to be something that's going to be fruitful, not only to me or to anyone that's around me, because now uh, we are closed and we need to move on with our careers. And we lost a lot of the things that allowed us to, uh, to move on. So I think like a, a more like a, an emotional sort, sort of person, like uh, emotional intelligence, let's say, than rational. And I think like allow me to develop my rational uh, side a little bit more. And I kind of like, like to think that I level up. And then that's like what I try to do to mitigate like what the effects that COVID was doing uh, for me. But Lillian, I wanted to ask like something, um, not only to you, but to everyone. One thing that we really lost uh, during COVID was the connection, right? So like was uh, going to conferences and talking to collaborators and in your case, talking to donors and people that will fund the projects that you do. And I know that like for a lot of researchers in Africa or Asia, Middle East, like there is, there's a huge, like, because we do like some of the podcasts for the mentorship and training committee. And a lot of people that I interview PIs from Africa, they say that there's a lot of emphasis in those meetings to be able to connect with people, conferences. So how was it for, uh, for you? Like, what did you see in people around you? Like, uh, did this loss of connectivity or going to the online conferences, did that, was that a challenge? And how did you uh, beat that challenge? Um, um, okay, so um, because I, I lead a professional society, so we have members, and before COVID, we, we, we had physical meetings every, every month or so, but we quickly moved to online webinars and, and meetings, and we could do them every week, so they were more frequent. Uh, in our meetings would reach probably 60, 70 people, now we're reaching up to 500 people in a meeting, in a webinar. Um, our meetings are mostly in the big towns in Nairobi, in the big cities, but now we are reaching people outside the towns. So I would say as much as there was no physical contact, we were 
people quickly adapted to the virtual space. Of course, eventually it became tiring and, and, and monotonous, but at the initial, uh, in, like I'd say in 2020, uh, most of the year people were ent enthusiastic about our online meetings and they were participating, would get up, up to 500 people. So I think that was a good way of just adjusting and, and people got used to it uh, for, for in, the immediate, in the immediate term, yeah. And Dylan, like you're heavily involved with ISH, I keep saying ish. Um, how was that? Like, let's say, like what Lillian was talking about. So we go through these conferences now with more people. So probably have more chances to connect with those people. And somehow it's still like a little difficult because it is in the online format. Format You need to go to uh, not personal poster presentations and so on, pre-recorded presentations and everything. So what would you have to say for people to be able to connect in a new era? era? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's going to be more challenging. The fact of the matter is it's going to be more challenging. And the biggest reason for that, in my opinion, is because it's very difficult to champion for people in an online setting, right? At a meeting, you know, I met so many people and Rhianne was my postdoctoral mentor just because she'd walk me up to somebody and say, this is somebody you should get to know. Um, much more challenging to do that in an online environment. And unfortunately, I think the only strategy I know that works is to take that on yourself to a certain extent and to be a person who approaches. There are, you know, there are emerging approaches for engaging, like Gather Town. Many of you may have used Gather Town or similar sort of virtual environments where you can walk up to people and have video chats. Um, but that that works really well for engaging with people, but it doesn't work really well for like introductions. And so I think that's the big thing that's missing. Um, and I don't know that we've solved that issue in an online environment yet. I, the fact of the matter is that it's not like meeting in person. Um, and so you have to take the good and just accept the bad, right? So take the good, it's way more accessible. You can probably see more science. You can interact with more people on a superficial level, but the fact of the matter is that those aren't, it isn't gonna be as deep as you're going to have in an in-person meeting. Stephanie, do you have any tips for uh, online mingling, let's say? Oh, oh man. So I miss people, right? I, I'm gonna admit it. I love scientific conferences. Right? There's, it's so good when you get to stand next to someone and argue at a poster. Right. And don't you miss? I love that. I love that. But what I can say is having online meetings, right? It's, it's better than nothing. Right. And so this kind of thing that you all are doing in ish is, is truly remarkable and helping people know that they, this is overused. I know they aren't alone in what they're feeling. They aren't alone in their different fears. There are different ways to do science with one another. One thing I think COVID has done is I've connected more with my international friends in the last year and a half than I ever have before. And that's because we go, this is now on our radar for how you communicate in ways it wasn't before that. I mean, go to, we've talked more in the last year and a half, right? Than in the year and a half before that. So, I, oh, good. I would, I think where we might end up is a mix of things. And that's having you know small meetings like the Keystone Symposia. They're going to start back up being face to face, and they're committed to do it. But that might be 300 people strong. I don't know what's going to happen. Say with larger meetings like American Heart, right, which moved from being in person to virtual in the states because of COVID, six weeks before the meeting was going to happen. So I think we all have to stay tuned. And it's the not knowing that I think can undo people. Uh, but we, we still have these things, right? And, and we do have one another. So, yet yeah, I'm corny. I'm an emotional, just like you are. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And Josie. Now, and now I am. <laughs> Josie, you wanted to say something. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that um, one of our societies did here was they, like you're saying, you know, we, we miss the random people that you bump into and chat to at conferences. What they did was they set up an online mentorship scheme. Um, so what we were able to do was just be randomly paired with a mentor and then a mentee. Um, so I had a mentor from Birmingham in England, and then I had a mentee in York, who's a first year PhD student. And what we did is we tried to meet up once a month or once every two weeks or whatever suited everybody. 
and have that random conversation that you would have over a poster. Um, you know, like, what are you working on? You know, have you tried this? That sort of stuff. And I actually met my mentee for the first time last weekend. She was up for a face-to-face -face conference in Edinburgh and I got to actually physically meet her. And she's a lot smaller than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> but we got to like have that, you know, we've made a bond over, you know, the last 18 months. Um, you know, we've chatted about things just like, how are you? How are you finding it outside of the lab? So that worked really well. Um, and then the other things that we did as part of NERD, so Guto mentioned, uh, Nusa mentioned about the NERD for early career researchers. Um, so we did Surviving a Pandemic PhD, which we basically spoke to PhD students and we were like, what are your current issues and how can we help? And we found that started a good dialogue and chatting about how people are finding, how finding things. And then the second thing we did was a mental health seminar where we had somebody from Dragonfly Mental Health and they spoke to us about um, like mental health literacy and like terminology that we're using and how to empathize and sympathize with people um, and to when recognize like we're saying when you're not okay as well as when other people are okay. So I find those kind of interactions just helped a bit more deal with the lack of conferences and interaction at our, at our end. No, it's perfect. So now I wanted to ask something about business. So we have like a question from Francisco here, and there is a little discussion for you guys to follow, a very good discussion here in the chat. But that's about grant applications, but not only grant applications. Let's talk about papers and produ productivity and all of that. So let's like forget about the social aspect and the friends and, uh, you know, the heart and everything. Let's go straight to business. So we had to close, right? And but we still being judged in the old, let's say the pre-COVID format where you need to have publications and you need to have uh, some sort of like productivity. You need to have preliminary data for your new applications and collaborations and so on. How do you think that this COVID has changed that? And what have you done during COVID to ensure that the productivity of you and your people was not intact, but like, was this still good enough for them to even slowly progress their career on their career path. Can I start, Gudo? Yeah. Okay. So there is not a scientist I know, at least I can speak at Michigan State University, who doesn't understand that COVID made us all come to that screeching halt, right, on some things. When I am on editorial boards, when I am in study section and the like, I think people, are, they are so aware of the fact that when we're looking at a new investigator, we have to take this into account. And in fact, before every NIH study section, you are on a conference call with what will be the scientific officer. So the person who will run that study section, and they specifically talk about the fact that COVID happened, right? And there are rules that NIH is gonna use in terms of extending ESI status in terms of, the word lenient is not exactly the one I wanna use, but basically saying, all right, we get it, right? You still need to move forward. Um, and I have watched review committees and review panels really get it. Right, so here at MSU too, all of our assistant professors and so they get at least an extra year or two years on their tenure clock, right? And nobody's looking at that year, let's say 2020 to say, oh, well, you, you're no good. You didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. Right? And I, I can state at least for where I live that people will be fiercely protective of younger people because we know that they're trying to get their career off the ground during a time that was less than optimal to do so. And if we don't give them that kind of grace, shame on us, right? But this is where it's going to take people like me, right, who's been a full professor for 16 years, and others who look at something where if people are going to hold you accountable and say, no, no, that's not okay. That's not all right. And I have gone to different people at our universities re to reappointment, right? promotion and tenure committees and say, you all have to be aware of this. You must be, grant committees must be. Guto, can I guarantee that people will follow through on that? Not absolutely. 
but I I haven't heard a person say, well, these people, they, it doesn't matter that COVID happened. They just need to get on the horse and keep going. That's not something I've heard. So if you all have heard it, tell older people, tell maybe more senior people and let us help and do the stern talk, the either electronic strong words or meetings that need to happen so people get it, right? That's, I, I don't want that for any of you. So, so that's like now a question for uh, Josie, Dylan, Lillian and Christina, if you have any experiences on this, is that specific to the States or Michigan? Have you seen anything different as elsewhere? So I, I can speak to Canada. So in Canada, the institutes are very much on board with what, what Stephanie just outlined. The institutes are very understanding. We've done the same thing in terms of extending, you know, the tenure process um, have been very good. On the grant panels, it's hit or miss, and it really depends on the reviewer. From what I've seen, there are reviewers who are very understanding and are like, look, this person has, you know, had this impact. You have to understand that. And then there are reviewers that don't really take that into account. And I think, you know, I, I think our chairs could be doing more to deal with that. And I think CIHR has been on them following the last couple of competitions. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll know better in the next round of reviews whether that's had an impact. But it, you know, there is some movement there to, to sort of promote this understanding. You know, if you're on the other side of this, you're the person applying, um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't assume that they, you're going to get that understanding. And, and so I think you need some strategies to mitigate that, right? So if you can't be in the lab generating new data, there are some things in silica that you can do, looking at existing data sets and pulling down data that might be able to help justify your grant. You might be able to reach out to collaborators. I know, you know, in the early stages of when my lab went back, I ran a lot of samples for people who couldn't run their own samples just to help them get some data. Um, and so there may be ways to, you know, with collegiality and, and, and that sort of thing that you can get around it as well. Um, so, you know, I, you would hope that that would be, uh, there would be understanding for in terms of getting data, but I think you, you should also do what you can to sort of work around that with the tools that are available to you. Lillian, uh, have you, do you have anything uh, to add from your perspective? No, I, I don't have much to add. I just uh, want to agree with the rest that I think the fact that everybody's going through this phase uh, including the the donors and and, and everybody and, and us who are implementing then it's 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 i think it's it's about communicating and and and, and just letting them know that this is where you are and this is the plan so i'll, I'll just add that and Josie, not putting you in the spot but putting you in the spot as they know the researcher ready to fly uh what are you afraid of? Like, not afraid of, but like, what's your concerns in terms of like you now moving to a fully independent and amazing researcher that you are? So what kind of concerns come to your mind? Yeah, so from my side of things, at the, the start of 2020, I was so lucky to be awarded money from the NHS to have like my first actual project where I could bat run with stuff and produce my own work and my own data. I was also granted a scholarship where I was able to have my own little student um, and I'd basically supervise them through a three month project and, you know, and guide them through as gaining experience as a supervisor, but also being supervised for my PI to help me with that. And the third thing I was very lucky to be awarded was um, a travel scholarship to go to France to learn a brand new technique to bring back to the University of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So I was like totally pumped, ready to go. And then obviously COVID happened. Um, my personal, you know, the, the independent funding, the first project, um, I was so lucky that it, they totally understood and they were like, this has been, you know, delayed. So the start date got pushed back to September. So that really gave me motivation to get the head down and, and get through these samples because I've been given this amazing opportunity. Um, for the mm -hmm. summer scholarship, unfortunately, the students which I'd interviewed, obviously, were then moving on and they were going into their, you know, fourth year or a master's or whatever so but I was really lucky in the fact that I can add this onto my CV um, with the hope that I was competitively in the process and I was still granted it and then for the travel scholarship I've just found out today that hopefully Touchwood I might still be able to go to France to learn this new technique for the institute so uh, mixed 
I would say. Um, it's definitely motivated me and made me realise that I really need to not make excuses for myself and not be like, oh, because of COVID, I didn't get this done, this done, this done. But actually, it's motivated me to be like, right, I'm back in the lab. I'm going to get my work done. I'm going to get more funding, more publications and try and be the best researcher that I can be, which might mm -hmm. not be great compared to everybody else, but <laughs> in my world. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, it is great. <laughs> yeah. Christina, I have like a special question for you that like, I would love to hear your opinion on. So with all the things that we shared, right? So uh, we are all exposed to this online life and that comes exposure to uh, a heavy social media presence. So a lot of people that I've seen, like students uh, or even like colleagues, they were on Twitter seeing like other people being successful. People like that were really advertising to know, I got this grant and I got this fellowship and I got like, Joseph, not saying about you, like no, it's just, I'm just linking to the thing. So uh, you see like a lot of people were very happy because they needed to, to transfer their happiness and they need to celebrate and that was the way to do it. But instigate a lot of like imposter syndrome and it, it shook a lot of people's resilience. And what would you have to say to us to really filter this uh, social media toxicity as like Stephanie said once to us and make sure that we build a strong resilience and we're kind of like immune to, uh, to this imposter syndrome that social media can create on you? What a fabulous question. Thank you, Guta. Yeah, and imposterism and imposter syndrome is something that we continue to work on for sure with so many of our clients. Regarding the social media part, um, that was actually a really important part of addressing mental health concerns during the pandemic and continues to be. Um, I, I find it an interesting thing as being someone who did not grow up it, with social media. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stephanie, I see you, yes. Um, no, I noticed that because I tried to find you on Twitter and I couldn't find you to uh, tag yeah, you there. I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, it's what I find interesting because it's just, you know, not part of my mental landscape is people forget that they can choose who they follow on social media. They forget that they can make adjustments to the fee, their fee. And so one of the things that um, I frequently talk about with clients both now and certainly throughout the pandemic was you need to make active, mindful, and thoughtful choices about your social media and actually, frankly, about the news at large, you know, because whether it be feeding that imposter syndrome or just being drowned in a tidal wave of negativity, uh, those are one of the things that we have to make a conscientious and mindful choice about. Certainly, I want to advocate for staying informed, you know, stay up to date on, on what's important, but make a conscious choice of stopping social media use at certain times. Give yourself a break from social media. Um, and remember how very, um, what's the right word? There's certainly like in the context that you're describing it, people wanting to celebrate successes, that's great. But there's also a great deal on social media that uh, you can very quickly fall into that negative comparison of self to others. And uh, that can most certainly foster increased anxiety and increased depression. So you have to take into account, um, you don't know the other person's circumstances. You don't know what their situation is. It's different from yours. And our tendency is oftentimes to negatively compare ourselves to others and see then ourselves as a failure. And that does not take into account your own individual circumstances that you're dealing with. So it's important to take those details into account. Thank you, Christina. Hi, I'm back. But yes, we are back. So, Yay! Yes, I've, I've been here for quite some time during here. Yeah, it's so interesting talks. So time is up now, but I, I'd like to make just one last question to all. So guys, how, how do you think COVID-19 will shape our future? Can I start with you, Dylan? Well, I hope we'll take the good 
which is that there was a pretty powerful selection pressure on technology and technology advanced pretty quickly to accommodate engagement. And it has absolutely pushed for sort of more inclusive involvement in many scientific meetings. Um, and so I hope we take that away from it. Um, there's gonna be a legacy of um, people who missed out on interactions and, and that for a long time. Um, and, and we're gonna have to deal with that. And I think the only other thing I would say is, you know, I do expect a very powerful celebration afterwards when we can agree that this is be gone back. The meetings are going to be vibrant um, and, and it's gonna be like the roaring twenties all over again, I think. So I, I'm, I hope that that's part of the future as well. I hope we take, take the good from what's, what, we've, we've, what, what we have right now and then just focus on the fact that we're back together rather than anything else. Thank you, Dylan. And the other, anyone want to share something more? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just, go ahead, please go ahead. So I just wanted to say, I have my flapper dress ready, Dr. Berger, <laughs> for the Roaring Twenties, for sure. Um, I think I'm old enough to have maybe, maybe just a bit of perspective, especially having a son who is so disabled and a husband who has nearly lost his life a number of times is I feel so lucky to be here, right? Uh, I just turned 55 last week, right? So I am loving the fact that I get to keep living right, in the face of all this. So my mindset is I'm going to make my life the very best that I can, right? Whatever the circumstances are, even if they're not pretty, I still get to live it. And I still get to try and I may fail, but I get to try and I get to breathe the air and look at the sun. And it's really as simple as that. Right? So that's, that's a perspective being older than all of you has brought to me. We'll find a way, right? We really will. Thank you. That's You're inspiring. Josie? Josie? Yeah, thank you. I totally agree. And I'm there for the party. Definitely. I really think this has taught me to appreciate the little things, appreciate the tiny little victories, um, appreciate your family and your friends and your work colleagues. Like I, I totally miss my work family. Guto, I miss you. Um, you know, like it's just great being able to bump into people, see people, chat, um, and also made us sort of like prioritize things a bit better. I think instead of panicking about the little things that frustrate us and get angry about it, it just made you kind of be like, right, I've been through worse. You know, like how do I prioritize and how do I sort things? So I do think I totally agree with Dylan and Stephanie. There's so much positives we can take from this very bizarre experience. Thank you, Josie. So anyone think, wants to yeah. add? Huh? Lillian? Yes. Lillian, yes. I think, I think for me, what I take home is sometimes we need something drastic to make us think outside the box. Uh, because if I think of what, uh, our organization, I would say it's, it's actually grown more during the COVID times because of technology, because now we can connect our members from different parts of the country. We can get, um, for our, we do a lot of trainings. We get international speakers coming to participate in our trainings. Like we have a conference next week and we're going to be having a, a wider array of faculty, you know, in the meeting. And that was all because of COVID. So I think sometimes in life, you just need something drastic to throw you off and, and, and make you think outside the box. And definitely, I think that's what I take from this pandemic. Thank you. Christina. Yeah. Christina, yeah. Well, I just really want to applaud what I hear echoed in so many of you, um, which is that feeling of gratitude and increased awareness. Uh, we do have a lot of clinical research that emphasizes how beneficial gratitude is for good mental health. And I think going through hardship can help people recognize the blessing, or what are we going to call it, the good things in your life, um, even in the, in the midst or perhaps because of the hardship. So uh, I do want to support and encourage that. And I really hope that all of you will have this chance to get together sometime. <clears throat> we too, as I mentioned at the start of this discussion, have had increased accessibility and connection to people through, through the pandemic because we've learned technology in a different way. So I just want to emphasize, stay connected, stay in touch with one another. As I said, we are social creatures, we need community. 
Uh, and I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. So thank you. Yes, if you don't mind, I also have something mm -hmm. to say. I think like one thing that was very strong that COVID showed to us is our sense of community and how like, you know, we learn that we still need each other and we can count on each other. But the other thing too that I think like showed us how important and like our challenge, let's say, for the future is our interactions with the general public. I think COVID really put science on the spot and really show to us how many people think of what we do in terms of like vaccines and masks and how to educate people to be able to respect and help each other. Now, like you're saying like Instagram and everything, like again, social media, Christina, like you're seeing like, you know, people bashing obese, uh, obese people because, oh, if you don't eat properly, I'm like, why do I need to protect you if you don't eat properly? And those kind of like comments that were very negative and showed to us that we do have a challenge to not only like communicate with ourselves, but also we need to interact more with the general public and teach them the importance of what we do and how science is really important to the community. And I speak not only here in the UK, but also in Brazil, that uh, Brazilians are going through like a lot of problems with our president and so on. But really we need to we have like, I think we were aware of the scientific ignorance that is around there. So I guess like, I don't wanna finish with something negative, but that's like our new challenge, public engagement and, and make sure that we get better on that. Thank you, Guto. So, well, this has been such a very interesting discussion. I think we could say it, uh, there's so much more that we could talk we want to talk, but uh, the time is up. So thank you. We would like to thank you very much to all the speakers today for sharing this moment, uh, your feelings and your thoughts and your knowledge here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the attendees. And please remember to check on each NIC. We have a lot of opportunities going on, especially for investigators. And uh, stay safe, everyone. I hope to see you all in the next Ish Live. <laughs>